So that was good. Yeah, a recipe for a healthy marriage. And how many... Um, no, I won't ask that question. Lois and I have this uh, kind of agreement. I don't know. It's, it's, it's not in the marriage contract so much. It's just that she does all the cooking. And I don't complain. So, that, do I complain? Never, right. Because I don't cook. And so I have no right to complain. Because if she said, well, you cook then, then we both starve. So, it's kind of altruism at work, I don't know. But, yeah, so we have these unwritten rules in our marriage. And, um, you know, a lot of you do cook. How many of you do cook? Almost everybody. So I'm, I'm in a clear minority. Dave and I are in the clear minority. Um, and there are certain things you make that you could make blindfolded, right? You just throw them together and they're so easy and you've done it hundreds of times and you don't even have to think about it. You just throw it, all this stuff together and, and it's great. So it's those things you can just, you know, fall back on. And, you know, and me, the one who's eating, you're just like, ah, oh, this is great. This, oh, it's, you're making that? I love that. And I'm all ready to eat, you know, and I'm ready to do my part. Um, so, so, then, so then you sit down and you start eating. Something's not right, but you can't say anything. And so you're waiting for the cook to say, what's missing? Right? You, you, you evolve, you who know what I'm talking about, right? Um, you, you just, what's missing? What did I forget? So finally, finally the, the cook says, what did I forget to put in? What's the missing ingredient here? What did I, did I forget the baking soda? You know, something that I would, what's baking soda anyway? You know, it's just, it's like you get in a bottle, right? It's baking, you drink it, no. So, you know, I wouldn't know anything about, but did I put in the, did I put in, what did I, no salt. Sometimes Lois will say, she'll, it'll be kind of a preemptive strike. She'll put it down in front of me and say, this needs salt. So, so we already know, you know, the, the drama is, is, is gone there. But, yeah, missing ingredients. You know, it's like that in relationships, too. Um, it doesn't take long. When you, if you're with a family, it's not your family, or even if it is your family, but if you're a guest and you're, you're with a family and there's a family gathering and Something's wrong here. What's missing here? How come they're always talking about so-and-so and so-and-so and -so isn't here? How come this? How come the, you know, after you, you kind of, but you can't say anything. Um, something's missing. So this morning we're looking at what Peter describes as the ingredients of a healthy, godly marriage. And, um, you know, sorry if, if, it, if all of this, uh, some of you aren't married or divorced or whatever, um, and you're like, well, this doesn't apply to me. But maybe something will somewhere along the line, so hang in there with us. And, and if you don't, you know, I won't know the difference, right? Except you'll be texting the whole sermon. I'm like, whoa, whoa. okay. So 1 Peter 3, 1 and 2, there were 1 through 7, but the first two verses, um, we won't be able to find it because Gene's not here. So 1293, 
1295. Okay. Oh, oh, I f forget. Yeah. Get thee behind me. <laughs> not, not exactly. No, that was wrong. Okay. Well, likewise, wives be subject to your own husbands so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. You know, how we live our lives from day to day is, is we can share Christ, but walking in the word, doing what the word says, when people see Christ living on, in us, that's our biggest Christian witness. You know, consistency is so important. So many people live inconsistent lives. They live one way while they're in church and a different way when they're at home during the week. It used to be said that learning behavior, learning behavior is more caught than taught. It's an old concept and it keeps coming back but people watch what you do and then they catch on and copy what they see and that's especially true of children. You can teach your children with all kinds of words that it might as well be blah, 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 blah. But if they don't see it, they won't do it. There was, uh, there was a pastor, and again, I think last time I was talking about true stories and my stories or something, but I think this is a true story. Uh, a pastor told, you know, if you can't believe a pastor, who can you believe? But he tells this story shortly after becoming a Christian. A woman came to me for counsel regarding how she could best influence her non-believing husband. In response to her question, I shared these verses from 1 Peter chapter 3. And then I made the following suggestion. Excuse me. At a proper time, tell your husband what has happened to you. Tell him you became a Christian. Tell him about the love and forgiveness of Christ and what a difference he's making in your life. And then never mention another word about God or Christ or the gospel again until he asks you or until the Holy Spirit prompts you to speak. That's pretty hard. You know, you just say what happened. You know, God's working in me, and then don't talk about it anymore. Just show it. Wow. Tremendous counsel. Great counsel. Because, you know, I mean, usually you, you get like, well, drop this verse over here and drop verses all over the house and do, you know, bombard them with the gospel. Well, no, just show them the gospel. What a difference that is. Never mention another word. In the meantime, he said, live for Christ in all that you do. And they prayed together and then she went home to live for Christ and to love her husband as only Christ could enable her to do. So three months later, this pastor said, I had the privilege of leading her husband to Christ. At, th at that time, I asked him, what influenced you most for Christ? And wi without a moment's hesitation, he responded, it's been my wife. Several weeks ago, she told me how she'd come to know Christ personally. She said that she hoped that I would also come to Christ, but that she would not bug me. Whenever I had a question or whenever I was ready to know more, she would share with me she was a changed woman. She did not nag me or preach to me. She only loved me. You know, that's Jesus. He doesn't nag us. He loves us. He shows us the way. Says, here it is. It's free. Just have to believe it. 
And, and the husband said, I know that whatever she has is what I want and need. I believe that it is Jesus Christ. What a great story that is. You know, even if somebody made that story up, but I don't think they did. I think that was a true story. So I've heard so, similar stories like that of, of wives who have won over their husbands because they did what Jesus did. They loved them. They didn't nag them. They didn't try to manipulate them. They didn't, you know, say, you know, if you don't, you know, I'm, I'm leaving you. If you, you know, they didn't give them ultimatums. They just loved them. God expects us to be godly people. He expects us to be like him. Not, not only to please him, it does please him, but to be a witness. That's our witness. Yes, our witness is, is preaching the word and, and, and telling people about Christ, but our witness is as much behavior as anything else. Show them who Christ is in your life. You know, regardless of our circumstances or our environment, we're here to behave in a godly manner, to be like Christ. Three essentials for Christian behavior in a marriage. First is subjection. And this is this is uh, this is. I should have just skipped that first one because I'm already feeling glares and I'm not even looking at people. Yeah, well, you know. So, and it means submission. Peter tells the wives that they're to be in subjection or submission to their own husbands. And evidently, Peter's correcting a problem that exists in the church at that time. They weren't honoring or respecting the authority of their husbands in the home. Um, they were disregarding husbands' authority and leadership in the home. So. Uh, again, I know this is a touchy subject because we have all kinds of anecdotal reasons why we shouldn't do these things. Um, and people with, you know, rightly bring up, well, what if you have an abusive husband who's beating you up? And said, well, that's, that's not what he's talking about here. Again, very often in Scripture, People bring up issues that aren't being discussed in argument. Well, what about this? Well, yeah, well, that's an issue, but that's not what they're talking about here. It happens very often. But let's look at Ephesians 5, 15 through 21. Look carefully, then, how you walk. And, and Paul's talking to everybody here. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for this is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So Paul's talking about submitting to one another. And in effect, Peter, without saying it, is, is you're submitting, but you're also submitting to one another. It's what's... Uh, there's mutual, mutual submission in the home. You know, we're submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. You know, if there's a, a matter of, of some conflict in the home and the husband happens to be wrong, which doesn't happen often, but on occasion, on that rare occasion, you know, he's to submit to his wife. For wisdom, talk it over. Maybe you're wrong. And that's how you keep balance. You know, we, we, we need to understand what submission means. It, it means to yield yourself to the authority 
of the other person. Submission is a choice. It requires us to make adjustments to accommodate to each other. I'm trying to think of ways that I accommodate to Lois. We'll get back to you on that. But there are ways. You know, we accommodate to each other. We love each other and we're like, well, that's Wendell. He does that. It's not a big deal. I'll get over it. We could have a big argument about it or we could just go on to tomorrow. I, I, I think as one thing I've learned in, in years of marriage is there are certain things you just, I'm not going to die on that hill. You know, I'm just not going to, it's not worth it. What's the point? I mean, we can argue about things that don't exist. We can argue about the possibility of something and get into an argument and it's like, well, that doesn't even exist and we're arguing about it. It's just, is it a hobby, you know? Is arguing a hobby and we're just bringing up stuff to argue about? Sometimes it feels that way. And sometimes we'll say to each other, let's not do this. It's a choice. It's, let's not do this. And other things, you know, more fun, like staring at a wall or something. But just, let's not do this. Submission requires us to become, we're, we're dependent on each other. The second essential is pure living. And in verse 2, when they see your respectful and pure conduct, you know, this means to be clean and holy and free from he's talking about free from sexual sins we're supposed to be true to each other I mean that's in our vows and um, we promise that before the people that we're standing in front of and before God we're, we set ourselves apart for each other and unfaithfulness is incredibly destructive not just to each other but to our children, to our families, to everybody we know. It's so damaging. And, you know, we belong to each other. So how do I stay faithful? And that's through the third essential, which is the fear of God. <laughs> you don't want to live in fear. No, but sometimes it just wouldn't hurt. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Our motivation for all of this is it's reverence for Jesus Christ, reverence for God. And reverence is, in, in uh, King James, used to be fear. Fear is a reverence. It's, there's, there's a certain awesomeness about God that if you're doing something that clearly is against what he intends for you to do and what you promise not to do, maybe you should be afraid. It's not a bad thing. It's a pretty good deterrent. You know, I like, I like deterrents that keep me safe. I really do. I... I'm, I, I don't, you know, I, I, don't, I don't dislike policemen, but they're kind of there to keep me safe. And I like that. I don't cringe when I see a cop. I'm fine with that. I'm not doing anything wrong. They're there for my safety. And if I do something wrong, like, you know, blow through a stop sign or put someone else in danger and they come and want to have a discussion with me, that's probably a good thing. But I don't fear them. They're there for my safety. God's there for our safety. I'm not my own. I'm God's. Therefore, I will honor him with my life and my body. So, second ingredient, uh, God-honoring appearance. Oh, boy. 
Now you went from the frying pan into the fire here. And I, of course I always tell our former member Ed Wysocki's story and that many of you could tell better than I can. But the um, passage here says, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. A gentle and quiet spirit. You know, Peter's not talking about wearing makeup to church and things that churches sometimes time get sidetracked into appearances. And that's just a rabbit hole of problems. Like you can't wear this, these clothes or these clothes. And Ned's story, of course, was his daughter came to church, uh, a church that was very particular about clothes and was wearing jeans and it became a big issue. As of course, you know, half of us would not be able to come to church, right? Like, who's wearing jeans here? You know? oh, Patrick, I, I'll tell you the church later, but don't go there, okay? Because, but they had all these meetings, and they, you know, the elders met, and all of a sudden, somebody wore jeans to church, and so they they finally. And I, you know, I don't say this lightly. They they prayed about it. They met together. The deacons came together. You know, the elders of the church, and and finally they came up with a solution that if she came to the church again, they wouldn't say don't come in. They just give her a choir robe to wear, and you know, with an A on it. No, not with an A, but you know, kind of the same concept of you know, you're an apostate. Um, but we'll give you this choir robe and you'll be great. But see again, that's not what Peter's talking about. Oh, what's he talking about? He's talking about who you are inside. Not what you look like outside. Well, don't, you know, yeah, don't, don't do that, but that's not really the issue either, Peter said. You know, don't, don't, don't try to look beautiful and think you're pulling it off. Because beauty is something that's about matters of the heart. It's not the outward appearance. And of course there's nothing wrong with us um, in, in marriage to, to look good for each other. But, uh, you know, it's like I'm married now, I can just forget about my appearance, I can just let myself go. You know, I caught the big fish and now I'm on easy street and I can just forget about that. Well, no, I mean, the Lord clearly wants us to, to respect each other. and Nobody wants to live with somebody who doesn't care about themselves. A um, third ingredient of a godly marriage is a God-honoring attitude. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. A gentle and quiet spirit. You know, I think, when I think about myself, I'm, I have, a, I'm the reverse of this. I look gentle and quiet on the outside, and I could be churning like crazy on the inside. So, this doesn't apply to me, but um, but it's about yeah. The, what's the inward qualities that are pleasing to the Lord? That's what we're looking for here. You know, beauty isn't just skin deep; it goes much deeper. Peter says it's the hidden person of the heart. It's a description of, of your attitude, not what you've put on, not the outward appearance. Of course, 
God, um, men look on the outward appearance and God looks on the heart um, in the Old Testament. We're adorned with a gentle and quiet spirit. Some translations use the word meek here. Meek instead of quiet. And meekness isn't, it's not weakness. Meekness is strength under control. So you're a strong person, you look meek, but you're just not lashing out. You're just not, you know, you said this and I'm going to do this and I'm going to say this and you said that. Well, I can do one better and I can... Well, no, it's just, you know, someone who might say, I don't suffer fools gladly. <laughs> you know, they're quiet. And they're not going to waste their time on needless controversy and, and silliness. The Bible says this is precious. It's a great value in the sight of God. Number four is a God-honoring response. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children. This is six and seven verses 6 and 7 of chapter 3. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening, and you are her children, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel Again, don't throw things at me. Since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. You know, there's a lot of snippets in here that people get really upset about. But they, again, you've got to look at the context of the verse, of, the, of these verses. And it's so easy to take out a piece here and a piece there and, and say, well, that doesn't apply to me, or that's uh, cultural, that's that culture and not us. And, but let's look at the whole thing. You know, to obey something means to listen attentively or play, pay close attention to. If I'm going to obey something, I listen closely. Chuck Swindoll says, it's the idea of attending to the needs of another. So obeying isn't just, okay, I'll do it, whatever. It's not that. It's attending to somebody else's needs, which is what you do in a marriage if it's a good marriage. You attend to somebody else's needs that aren't your own. And, and listening is an art. Um, you know, it's not just, it's, it's it, it, this something I typically do, and you can ask Lois, Lois will say something, and I'll take it very literally and get upset. When I know she doesn't mean it literally, she means it, you know, in a general sense. But it's, it's discerning the intent of somebody's words, not the specific words. You know, when somebody talks to you and they're just trying to communicate, it's not a legal document that you're picking apart word by word if you love that person. If you're in court, that's different. But marriages hopefully don't end up in court, and unfortunately some do. But listening is, you know, we live, it says live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor. And we need to learn how to properly respond to the needs of our family members. We can't, we can't control their actions or their attitudes or, or their words as much as we might try. Um, but we can control how we respond to their actions and their attitudes and their words. We have choices in how we respond to things. And, um, and the fifth thing is living together in a God-honoring way. 
Likewise, husbands, verse 7, live with your wives in an understanding way. Really know them. Showing honor. It's the weaker vessel. Since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. They are heirs with you. You're not the heir, and then if they're lucky, they might get something in the will. They're heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. So live with your wives. Companionship is so important. Being together is so important. Um, a lot of marriages suffer from a lack of togetherness. Careers, as we know, have the potential to destroy relationships. We, we guys or women, same way, we get so involved in our careers and our careers are everything and we have all kinds of reasons why it really should be that way and you're lucky that I buy you all this stuff and blah, blah, blah. And, but it destroys a relationship. Outside interests sometimes destroy families. But if you want to show your family you love them, spend time with them. That's the greatest gift you could ever give your family. Spend time with them. We just spent 400 grand on a house so we could spend more time with our family. But, uh, oh, was I not supposed to say the amount? Anyway, it just... Yeah, but that's just money. You have, how often do you get to spend time with your family? And some of you hardly do. Some of them, some of your grandchildren are, you know, a country apart. And um, it's painful not to spend time with them. But understanding comes from Communication, you can't know someone without talking with them. The texting isn't enough. Texting's pretty good, but it's not good enough. It's more than just talking, it's looking, it's listening, it's learning, it's seeing the expression on your face when you say something. You can't get that in a text. And we've probably all heard, you know, listening isn't just waiting for your turn to talk. You know, you, you've been, we've all been in those conversations. We've done it ourselves. You know, we're like, are you done talking yet so I can say what's really important here? You know, and, and, and you're, you know, so many conversations, they're not conversations. There's one person just overlapping the other person. And... I, when I was a, I was a kid, I was like in high school, and I was with my my uncles, and they were talking to each other, and one was talking about his tie, and the other one was talking about I don't know his golf game or something, but they they just weren't talking with each other. One was talking about his tie, and then the other one would talk about golf, and then the other guy would talk about his tie, and then the, there was no conversation. It was just two people talking, like cross purpose, and it was like watching tennis or something, you know. But it wasn't a conversation. I'll never forget it. Um, we have to talk with each other. We have to really listen. And not take advantage of differences in our lives, but to value and respect differences. You know, they talk about irreconcilable differences. Why were they irreconcilable? Because you didn't want to accommodate. You didn't want to talk. You weren't spending time together. That's why they were, they weren't, the differences weren't irreconcilable. The attitudes were. And rather than allowing these things to tear us apart, you know, make them work for the good of the family. We need to honor and respect and value and love each other. So why are family relationships so important? Why, you know, why couldn't God just have a bunch of single people worshiping him? Could have, I guess. Do anything he wants. What's the big deal? Well, when we love each other, 
in our families in ways that honor God, it strengthens our relationship with God. God's a family guy. He's all about relationships. He's all about caring for one another and loving each other. He gave us each other. He gave us our families. There's this woman writing to a newspaper columnist. This was a long time ago. She just wrote this. She said, woman was created from the rib of a man. She was not made from his head to top him, nor out of his feet to be trampled upon by him, uh, but out of his side to be equal to him, under his arm to be protected, and near his heart to be loved. It's kind of a nice, kind of a nice touch. So we have relationships that honor God so that our prayers may not be hindered. So all of this, all of this is about our relationship with God. So this, all these little words that we get caught up on, the, the, the weaker whatever and the, you know, being submissive and this and that, we get all hung up on that. The context of all this is to love each other so we can have a great relationship with the Lord. That's the, that's the bottom line of all this. That's why we have God honoring relationships so that the most important way we communicate with God won't be hindered. Prayer is simply talking with God. Peter concludes... Um, saying that if we do this, if we honor God in our relationships and our families, our prayers will not be hindered. Our relationship with God won't be hindered. There's endless number of things that you can that can get in the way of our relationship with God. We can all we all have our own lists of the things that get in the way. Um, and when our Christian walk is one that dishonors God, how can we have a relationship with Him? If our marriage is in a situation that dishonors God, how can we have a really good relationship with God? So, what's the missing ingredient? You know, for, for a lot of us, it's who we are at home. We're a different person at home than we are um, out in public. And, you know, again, a lot of people think of this passage as controversial because, you know, it talks about the weaker vessel and being subject to husbands. And um, it's easy to get caught up in the controversies and miss the most important passage. Women are heirs with you of the grace of life. They're heirs with you. When they read the will, you're both on the same line, and you get the same stuff. He's not given more of his grace uh, to me and to Lois, both equal. We're children of God, therefore heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Romans 8, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, you know, with the same kind of love that Christ serves us. And we're heirs together. So, Lord, thank you that you've given us a Savior in our Lord Jesus Christ, who's been the perfect perfect example for us in every way. Thank you that, Lord, that you love us, you care for us, you guide us, you help us, you watch over us, and you give us relationships, and relationships that provide a blessing to each other and honor you. I pray that our, our relationships would honor you that others would see how we behave and want to be like us and ask us 
what is it about you that makes you different? And we could tell about the amazing grace that we have in our lives. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.